So tell us a bit about these two very basic models of theism and uh, explain to us what you mean, and I think very helpfully, by what you, you've termed theological mutualism. Right. And, and by, the, by that language of mutualism, um, I, don't, I don't mean um, that there is um, that God does not act toward us or on our behalf and that we do not respond in worship and obedience. I'm not talking about that. I, by mutualism, I mean very precisely um, that God is not involved with us in a relationship where he acts upon us and then is in turn acted upon by us. Or if I could put it in more operative terms, God is not um, a doer who is then done unto. Right. Um, he's a doer. All things are from him, through him, and to him. But he's not a done unto. He's not a receiver of opera of our operation. Or to put it in other language, he's not a patient, mm -hmm. the one who receives action upon himself. Rather, he is pure agent. Um, he is the one who gives to all life, breath, and all things. But he is not given to so as to be augmented, enhanced, um, or outfitted in any way by anything from the creature. And I think that really that maintains the creator creature distinction. God is the absolute giver and sustainer of being, but not in any respect, the receiver of it. If he were the receiver of it, he would not only be the maker of being, he would also be the made to be to whatever extent he received operation or our new act of being from the creature. Um, the question that I think we should ask, particularly with regard to what I sometimes call the, the both and theism, of some modern evangelicals that, that want to, on the one hand, unlike the open theists who I think rather consistently reject classical theism and aren't interested in maintaining its locutions or those confessions, they just simply, and I think honestly, in terms of their own position, repudiate those doctrines. They will not say God is immutable. They will, they deny he is impassable. They don't, they, they claim that infinity is in fact a form of imperfection, um, that pure actuality locks God out of vitality and life. And, you know, and so they, so they quite, I think, self, in a self-aware way, reject classical theism. There's another, the ones that concern me, and I think that we can kind of see that for what it is, and we can examine their exegetical or philosophical motivations, and we can get into a nice kind of cut and thrust and have, a, and have it out with them. What, what makes it more difficult with what I'm calling the evangelical theistic mutualists um, of a more conservative variety is that they are ones who don't want to, like the open theists or process theists, abandon classical theism outright, but they rather want to supplement it with a kind of almost a shadow theism a shadow doctrine of God, so that on the one side, you've got what the confession says. Um, I, I, I have the confession in front of me for just such a moment. There is one living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most free, most absolute. And then it goes on to talk about his operations, working all things according to his counsel. And I think what a lot of modern evangelicals find, particularly in statements like God being um, without parts or without passions or immutable or even eternal in the sense of not, you know, pro-chrononion, before chronological ages, this idea of a, of a non-chronological -chron life or timelessness, as we used to call it, um, or, or, or actual infinity of being, that seems to, to a lot of modern evangelicals, that seems to lock God out of a meaningful give and take yeah. relationship with the creature.